So what I'm saying is, when we say the magistrate, are we talking about an enthroned king who is reigning right now? And I think that's, that's, that's to me, uh, something that has been clarified. You've already got me in trouble. Thank you very much. Leaked footage from the G3 conference shows James White publicly rebuking Owen Strand. Stephen Wolf admits to being a dominionist. And Owen Strand discusses what he thinks about post-millennialism and Christian nationalism, are all post-millennialists Christian nationalists, and talks about suffering for Christ. Coming up. Welcome to Truth Transforms. My name's Adam Markley. We're going to talk about all of this today. Uh, there was a big conference, of course, a G3 conference on the sovereignty of God. And before that conference was the pre-conference, which was all about Christian nationalism. It was all about Christian nationalism and whether that should be accepted in Christianity, whether that should be embraced, whether that should be rejected. Most of the people on the stage were those that do not accept Christian nationalism and actually see it as a problematic doctrine. James White was the odd man out who does seem to purport a form of Christian nationalism, and so there was discussion that was had. There's some leaked footage about that as we all await for the actual footage to come. That footage is not available yet, but it will be released at some time. G3 will be releasing their footage of all of the, the sessions. They did stream it live, but never did they stream the pre-conference, and so we'll get to that at some point. I'm going to show you some of that footage. I'm also going to show you some other things that I think you'll find of interest. I'm going to show you some comments that James White made several months before having this panel. Also, Stephen Wolf and some comments he made about dominionism, and I think you'll find that insightful and helpful before seeing this footage. Also, you want to stick around to the end where Owen Strand talks about some of the issues that he thinks are going on right now, some of the issues that he sees. Let's go ahead and get started. We're going to talk about this panel here, uh, certainly, which uh, this is the panel moderated by Owen Strand. It features Josh Bice, Jeffrey Johnson, Jeff Moore, James Coates, Scott Annual, and James White, as you see there with the microphone. We're going to take a look at this clip first thing. This is James White giving us some discussion about his thoughts. It was actually a discussion about four months ago when this whole Christian national uh the whole Christian nationalism uh, controversy started up, and basically he's talking about just how ridiculous, how immature, and how slanderous the kind of behavior was online by people on both sides, really, and what uh, he wants to see more of. And so I'm going to play that clip, and then we'll get to the rest of it. And I have been very benefited by listening to others talking about these things, but I don't live in an echo chamber. I've listened to people on both sides. Um, I have a feeling that the Thursday in September, I think it's the third week of September, somewhere around there, um, when the pre-conference that Grace Bible Theological Seminary is having before G3, um, I have jokingly said, I am the um, I am what's on the menu <laughs> for for that that mini conference <clears throat> because I am the only theonomic post millennialist at GBTS on staff, and so we've got mainly all millennialists. But I I'm guessing I'm not a thousand percent certain, but I'm I'm getting the feeling that maybe Scott Annual might be pre millennial. Maybe even dispensational. I'm not sure. I'm not 100% certain. I couldn't tell from some of the things that we said. But there are differences amongst us. And now Josh Bice teaches for GBTS. So I think he's going to be involved with it. And so that's going to be a fascinating conversation. But it's going to be done collegially, respectfully, um, hopefully not with any of the kind of amazing vitriol that is being called for i i was reading people calling for this mm -hmm. i mean there's a, there's a bunch of there, 
Scott has said a number of things on Twitter where I go, nah, that's not really where we're going. That's that's not really what we're looking for. Um, and so I could, in our conversation, I'll go, yeah, no, that's not, that's not representational. And here's why. Man, on Twitter, it's, we need to run this guy out of the kingdom for misrepresenting us. How come he gets a free, some guy, how come he gets a free pass and all the rest of this? Yeah, it's a whole nother world on Twitter. And he's getting at the point that they can actually sit down and have a conversation and have a conversation where they can discuss the Bible, which unfortunately is not is not discussed in a whole lot of this. It's just a lot of philosophy, a lot of political theory, not a lot of Bible. And so what we need are meaningful conversations. I was saying that in podcasts four or five months ago, is that that's what we need. We need scriptural arguments, uh, emotional arguments, pointing to culture, all of those things as Bible-believing Christians who are uh, adhering to sola scriptura, we need to see it from scripture. We need to see these things from scripture. And uh, so hopefully that's what we had is a, a reasonable conversation. And if it, I did see in, so, in this clip, they talked about a couple of passages of scripture. There wasn't much in this clip, but I've got to show you this here first thing, just because a lot of people say Stephen Wolf is not a dominionist. And people keep saying, well, he's a dominionist. I, I certainly say uh, I kind of use Christian nationalism and dominionism interchangeably. I don't see the difference. I've asked people what the difference is. Uh, I've asked people like uh, Joel Webin, what's the difference? <laughs> he had a whole podcast on what's the difference, and he could explain what the difference was. Uh, I don't know what the difference is. I don't see a difference. It seems like the same thing to me. And here is what Stephen Wolf has to say about it. Hey, what is my account? Fundamentally, it is kind of a nationalist version of old Presbyterian politics, um, political thought, uh, or, cl or classical Protestant political thought, which people don't really know. And because it's the, the revival of all that is somewhat new. So it's hard for me to give you like that, that definite, this is what it is. But I mean, it, like dominionism, it would be wrong to start, you know, uh, listing names and say Wolf's influenced by these, the, these people. But there is some, there is an aspect to where dominionism, as a, just as the term itself, would kind of fit what I'm what I'm going for. That there that Christians Christian nationalism is an ex, is a fulfillment <laughs> of sorry, the dominion mandate, and that what what this means to subdue um, and multiply on the earth is to create nations that honor God. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's it. It was just a sixty second clip, uh, real short. But I mean, he is saying there is a dominion mandate there is a dominion mandate where to go and take dominion and that is what he believes and so he believes of course that is part of the mission of the church he would believe that that's part of the great commission is to go and take dominion to go and baptize nations i mean that would all be part of it uh he is a millennial he's not post millennial but uh he he is saying well yeah it would be accurate to describe what I'm purporting as dominionism. So anyway, it's just a short little clip I found. I'm not using it as a definitive evidence for anything. I'm just putting it out there. You make the call as to what you think that means. Now, let's get to the clip that you're waiting for and interact with that. All right, so here is the clip right here. Let's, let's, let's use the big things going on right now, transgenderism. Can I, can I have oh, okay. Hang story? on. Context. The, let's, let's, this let's isn't the whole clip. So, like, I they were discussing some different passages of scripture. Uh, uh, Scott Annual asked James White if he thinks that Psalm two is a gospel call to repentance and faith. And uh, James started uh, giving kind of sort of an answer on that and. And uh, he started talking about Daniel 7, and we see that as the enthronement of Christ. And then he just went into, well, what's Christ doing now? If he's king, if he's enthroned, what does that mean for us? And now we're getting into a cultural example that he's giving regarding transgenderism. So that's where we're going to pick it up. And then he's going to go into some other things uh, and 
we'll get the we'll get there in a moment. So here it is. Let's 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 use the big things going on right now. Transgenderism. Um, can I can I have thirty seconds to tell the story? I was on Do it. I was on uh, the Dr. Drew show on CNN. I think it was in twenty sixteen on transgenderism. I was on with the same guy. Did you all see with that that former army pilot who manifests as a woman now when Ben Shapiro was on? He took this big old hunk in hand and he put it on Ben Shapiro's shoulder and threatened him with a deep manly voice uh, as a woman. Uh, I was on with him. And uh, at, at one point during the conversation, uh, I quoted Matthew chapter 19, where Jesus says, from the beginning, God made them male and female. And the, one, of the, one of Dr. Drew's sidekicks basically says, well, you know, that's just one religious leader. And my response was, this is a religious leader that predicted his own death, burial, and resurrection, then died, was buried, rose again the third day, and ascended into heaven. When you can pull that off, we'll worry about your opinions about these things. Till then, he's Lord. Amen. And he had absolutely no idea what to, what to even say in response to that. So what I'm saying is, what do we, when we say to the magistrate, are we talking about an enthroned king who is reigning right now? And I think that's, that's, that's to me, uh, something that has been clarified since 2020. We've all had to think about this more than, I, I, would you all agree that this would have been a very different conversation in 2019? Mm -hmm. And if so, why? And which direction has it moved? Okay, there, because... Would you all agree that this would be a very different conversation in 2019. That's what he's saying. It's got Annual shaking his head and and um, they're saying some things. Got to that too early. But, you know, the reality is it shouldn't be a different conversation at that time. I mean, it, it really shouldn't be a different conversation. It should be the same conversation at all time because of the fact that uh, we're talking about government overreach and the church sin what's disobedience to god that when the government requests things that are in disobedience to god we say no that, that we believe romans 13 that we're to submit to authorities and we also believe acts 5 29 when the apostles are told not to preach the gospel of jesus christ we must obey god rather than men and so these are the things that are uh, these are the things that are true. And so if you remember this right here, uh, City of Houston demands pastors turn over sermons, May 7th, 2015. What happened at that time? Did the churches just cave? Uh, there are always churches that cave, but that's a test of the faithful and the faithless. That's a test of those who will remain faithful to Christ. And the ones that remain faithful to Christ said, no, you don't get access to all of our notes, all of our sermons, all of our, I mean, the sermons are online generally, but they wanted to control, ultimately, it's a starting point to set a precedent to control what pastors can preach. And so what happened? Churches rose up, they got their Christian lawyers, they, they did all of these things and said, you're not going to have access to all of our sermon notes. They wanted pastors' sermon notes and all of their prep. They wanted to hand it over to the state. And we said, no, we must obey God rather than men. So it shouldn't really be a different conversation. Certainly we have different areas of application now. And so there is that aspect, but it really shouldn't be a different conversation. But let's get right back to this and continue. I remember when Grace reopened and John MacArthur preached that sermon. I'm sitting here going, hot dog, listen to that. Because <laughs> I'm going, we're, we're, we aren't moving the other direction. We're moving much toward, much more toward a direction that says to the state, um, Christ is Lord and he, he, you, there, are, there are limits here. And by the way, you've already gotten limits. in trouble. Thank you very much. Because you started off your, your talk identifying me as a Christian nationalist, which I've never identified myself as. Um, if Christian national, if, as, I, as I said in my dialogue with Doug Wilson, if Christian nationalist means 
blessed is the nation whose God is Yahweh, and sin is a reproach to any people, I think we'd all probably fall into that category. Um, but obviously much more is being said now than that type of a simplistic type of a situation. And so, uh, yeah, you, 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 got me, you got me in trouble with that one. Uh, so I, I, that's not terminology I use myself. So unless you're going to say all post-millennialists are Christian nationalists, um, that, that, that causes a, a, a problem. So there's the rebuke in James White, gracious fashion. <laughs> Hey, you you got me in a lot of trouble. Called me a Christian nationalist. I don't go by that label. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, what I was what I was trying to get at, in all seriousness, uh, genuine apologies for the error. What I was trying to get at was that there are people who track with you who would claim the label Christian yes. nationalist. Yeah. They are post millennialist as you are. Um, and yet their approach to the issue would be based on the gospel. And what I was thinking there was more like how a Doug Wilson has framed things in his recent book, Mere, I think, is it Mere Christendom? Yes. Yeah. And so I attributed that to you directly. What I meant, what I was trying to get at was there's a stream here right. that would affirm some form. Well, I, was, I wasn't offended. I, it's just not terminology that I use. And I've done two sort of best dialogues with Doug, one on the Wolf book. Uh, and one on uh, Mere Christendom. And if anybody's listened to those, my concerns about sacralism, the breaking down of the distinctions between family, church, state, the, the sphere of sovereignty has been consistent in all of that. I've, I've tried to be very, very straightforward in that. Uh, but at the same time, I think there's, I, I tried to explain that the, why we did what we did with masks, vaccines, uh, the seals, why all of that stuff has a foundational basis. And I, and I think in all of this, we're all seeing that what we, what we were, and we're all old enough, so, well, okay, sorry, Jeff. Um, most of us are old enough that we were active in the 80s. And I just sit back and I go, man, things have changed. And for me, I'm just simply admitting, I accepted things out of tradition in the 80s and 90s, and I was never forced to think about it. Now we're being forced to think about it. And I'm concerned that we're shooting at each other way, way, way too early. I mean, my position is we're not in a position to answer a lot of the questions right now. Because my understanding is the only way that this is ever going to really manifest itself is when there has been a massive move of the Spirit of God. And, you know, yeah, there needs to be a massive move of the spirit of God. And when he said we're shooting at each other too early, we're far more than shooting at each other. I mean, Christian nationalists, proponents of this stuff, they want to cut people out of the kingdom. I want to say you're not even in the kingdom if you're, you know, not on board. I mean, it's it's far beyond uh, it, it's far beyond just get going at each other too early. I mean, basically what we're talking about with this is. Um, Persecution's coming, suffering for Christ, and those that are purporting Christian nationalism, I fear, would look at those that oppose it and say, I don't see that in scripture, I reject that. They would look at them and, I mean, they're already slandering, they're already smearing, they're already doing all kinds of that, they're already attributing false motives, all kinds of stuff, and they also, I could see them just well, a brother is being persecuted. It's like, well, you deserve it. You weren't on board with Christian nationalism, so you deserve it. It's like, it's a hatred of the brothers, hatred of brethren. Uh, clear violation of scripture, uh, absolute disobedience. I mean, that's, a, that's, a, uh, that's an evidence of faith, First John 4, 9. To, to, to the sign of, of uh, believers is that we love one another, that, that there's brotherly love. And um, there should be, you know, yeah, there's bickering, but there, you know, there's, but you repent and there should be, uh, life should be marked by love for the brethren. We must uh, discuss doctrine. We must expose false doctrine and all of those things. There must be correction, but hating the brother, hating brothers in Christ, slandering brothers in Christ. That's completely different. That's very, very different. When, who was it that mentioned the Christian prince 
Um, was Jack it Moore did and I did. Okay. See, see, that can't happen until the vast majority of the people are truly converted. And then, how could you avoid having a, a, a prince who is a Christian? But I, I'm very concerned about the idea of making a Christian prince like we used to have. I guess some people are using the terminology of Christendom 1.0. Well, okay. That really, really concerns me. That kind of, that kind of language really, really concerns me. Um, because from my perspective, if there's no change in the heart, you're going to get the exact same results. And the results were uh, Fritz Herba in, in the bottom of a, of, of a well, basically. But we've got to struggle with the fact that Luther knew he was there. Luther knew he was there. That's our heritage. So how do we deal with that? And as a Baptist, I, I have other things I have to add to that. <laughs> yeah, I um, well, appreciate that. Good first question. Uh, there, that's the end uh, of that. Me... i got to show you what Owen Strand said. Let me show you that here real quick. Hey, if you appreciate that, don't mind hitting that like button. I'd appreciate that. That helps to reach more people. Go ahead and hit that like button. That would be helpful. Now, I'm going to find that for you with Owen Strand, and we are going to uh, we're going to find that here in just a moment. He's asked about post-millennialism. So there's a whole interview Owen Strand had. It was uh, during a, a live stream at the conference, and they had these live streams going during that time at the conference. And he was asked a number of things. He was asked about kinism. He was asked about post-millennialism. He was asked about all kinds of stuff. And there's something specific that he said in response to post-millennialism. He gave clarification on post-millennialism. This is about two minutes, this clip here. And he's asked about post-millennialism. It says, uh, you know, are all post-millennials, uh, anyone that holds to post-millennialism, are they automatically Christian nationalists? So that's what he's asked. Here's what he says. Society. I think another clarification, too, within this Christian nationalism debate is I think a lot of people are trying to lump post-millennials into Christian nationalism. So right. if you are a post-mill, you're automatically some form of Christian nationalist. How would you clarify that a little bit more and maybe push back against that? A lot of post-mill guys are Christian nationalists, but not all post-mill guys are. So um, that's what I would say very quickly. There's different streams of Christian nationalism and there's different streams of post-millennialism. Um, there are some like Jonathan Edwards or James White at the school at which I teach, we're faculty members together. Mm -hmm. And he would argue from his post-millennial convictions that you preach the gospel and that's how the world becomes Christianized. Yep. And um, I don't hold that view. I would argue against that view, but that's Jonathan Edwards' view and Jonathan Edwards is my favorite theologian. So. Um, so that's a viable view. Yeah, and see, Jonathan Edwards didn't believe that we were living in the millennium, unlike this new Doug Wilson camp post-millennialism. It's very different. Uh, this theonomic post-millennialism is really very different. Um, Jonathan Edwards believed that through the preaching of the gospel, the proclamation of the gospel, the saving of souls, the converting of those souls to Christ, that uh, enough people would be one for Christ, and that it would ultimately usher in the kingdom of God in its literal form. That's his form of post-millennialism. He did not believe that we were living in the millennium. He did not believe that he was living in the millennium, but that through the preaching of the gospel, the millennium would come. Now, that's not the post-millennialism that's being purported today. That's the point that, uh, well, he didn't go in that much detail, but that's the point that Owen Strand is, is saying there about it is a different post-millennialism than Jonathan Edwards held. But um, the argument that we are going to make the world more Christian by law primarily is a different stream from that, and that's one that I would, I would have concerns about as well. I think there is still a case you can make for theonomy, for example. I haven't seen it, but, you know, so he's trying to be very, very charitable. I think too charitable at this point with some of the things that he says, but let's just keep playing. But, um, but that is not what I would find in scripture myself. But there are some in the post-millennial crowd who believe that the world is going to be Christianized Yes, by the gospel, but also by getting laws on the books 
That's how you kind of prepare the world to be Christian. And I just find no grounding for that in the New Covenant. I want good law, but I don't think that's going to make the world Christian. The world becomes... Oh, this is... Oh. I should have I should back it up a little bit. I wanted to jump on that. I want good law just because that's another one of those straw men by a Christian nationalist. They're like, well, if you're not a Christian nationalist, then you hate Christ. You don't want good law. You want, you know, all these terrible things to happen. It's just it's ad hominem. It's when you can't debate the topic, when you can't actually make an argument from scripture, you attack the person and you attack people that hold a, a particular view, gospel-centered Christians, rather than actually making arguments from Scripture. I'm seeing it again and again all over the place. It's very, it's very distressing and very disturbing and very sad that Christians are willing to slander and smear those that don't adhere to their Christian nationalist dominionism. The world becomes Christian when Jesus comes back and makes it his footstool. That's when all the sad things come untrue. That's when evil is undone. That is when Jesus reigns visibly on earth with his people. We yearn for that. I fear many people are being pulled away from New Testament imperatives. And this is, this is big coming here including to simply have faith and to suffer for Christ because the times are so dark in Canada, America, and beyond that people are almost like the trusting Christ by faith thing isn't getting it done. Yeah, the trusting Christ alone, trusting Christ and being faithful to Christ thing, that's just not getting it done. That's a powerful statement. And that's exactly what we're seeing is there are those that are being faithful to Christ and understanding that the Bible teaches about persecution and that there is persecution and there is suffering for Christ. And there can be arguments about different eschatological views as long as they're not slandering other believers and smearing other believers as having false motives because they simply say the mission of the church is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. People are going to hell and we need to preach the gospel, call them to repentance and faith, to turn from their sins, to trust in Christ and Christ alone for salvation. And through trusting in Christ and his work on the cross, they will be saved from eternal damnation. And that's the gospel. And that's what people need to believe. And that's what we need to proclaim. And that's enough. And yes, there are lots of things that flow out of the gospel. And yes, there's political action. And yes, we would love to have uh, Christian governors and Christian uh, princes, sure, I'll take a Christian prince, but we it's not our mandate to make a Christian prince. Uh, Christian nationalists have said things like, you know, we actually have an answer so that if someone does come to faith, if a leader does come to faith, if a king comes to faith, we actually have something to say to them. And it's like we have the word of God. That's pastors, like, I've heard them ask questions like to non-Christian nationalists, like what would they do if a governor came to faith? What would they do if a president came to faith? What would they do if a king came to faith? But disciple them, teach them God's word so that they could govern according to God's word so that their conscience would be following in the ways of God like any Christian. They would have a biblical worldview, and from a regenerate heart, they would govern according to that regenerate heart and that informed conscience informed from the word of God. So we're so tired of these straw men. We're so tired of this stuff. We want honest debate, and we want people to go to scripture. And so I hope that we at least see some of that. 
when this pre-conference is released. This is just a small little portion of that. Well, if you've been watching, you're watching Truth Transforms. My name's Adam Markley. The goal of Truth Transforms is to transform hearts and transform minds through the truth of God's Word. Because without the truth of God's Word, it doesn't really matter what we have to say. We're not on this planet to push political philosophy or to push political theory or any one of those things. No, we're here to preach the gospel of Christ and to proclaim the truth of God's Word. So go ahead and subscribe. Hit that like button so you get more content like this. Not necessarily Christian nationalism content. I don't really want to do a lot of this stuff, but let me know if you do want more of that and I'll consider it. Uh, God bless you and I will see you in the next. Oh, you can watch the Christian Nationalist playlist. It's right here. And God bless you. I'll see you in the next episode.